Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 341 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new sci fi channel show Night Flyers, based on the novella by George R.R. R. Martin. And this one involves spoilers for all of season one, for the 1987 feature film, and for the original novella, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Erin Lindsay, making her 11th appearance on the show. She's the author of the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels from Ace, as well as the Nicholas Lenoir series of historical paranormal detective novels from Rock, which she writes under the name E.L. Tetensor. Her historical mystery murder on Millionaire's Row is out now. So Erin, welcome to the show. Hi, great to be back. Then next up, we've got Matthew Kressel, making his fifth appearance on the show. He's the author of the novel King of Shards, and his short story, The Last Novelist, or A Dead Lizard in the Yard, was nominated for the Nibial Award and was a finalist for the Yuji Foster Memorial Award. Together with Ellen Datlow, he hosts the monthly Fantastic Fiction Reading Series at the KGB Bar in New York. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. And also joining us today is Andrea Kale, making her fourth appearance on the show. She's a graduate of the Odyssey Writers' Workshop, and her short fiction appears in the Writers of the Future anthology, Fantasy Magazine, and Lightspeed. She's also a television writer and producer, and was the script supervisor for Late Night with Conan O'Brien. So, Andrea, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. Okay, so first of all, I want to talk about this original George R. R. Martin Night Flyers novella, which was first published in 1980. Uh, if you know anything about George's early career, you'll know that he started out writing space opera in the 1970s and transitioned to writing more horror in the 1980s. And so this is sort of in a transitional period where he was combining the two. And one of my all-time favorite short stories is called Sand Kings, and it was written around the same time. And it's the, the most successful science fiction horror hybrid story that I've ever read. And the success of that encouraged him to, to try to write something similar, which was Night Flyers. Um, and so I think everyone here has read, read this novella, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so so the premise is that there's a, a group of people going to try to contact uh, an obscure alien species, which exists pretty much only in legend. And they're led by this guy, DeBrannon. And so they charter this ship called the Night Flyer, which is sort of this strange ship where it doesn't have a crew. It's all automated, except for the captain who never leaves his quarters and communicates only through voice and sort of holographic projections and the passengers become increasingly suspicious and paranoid about whether there actually is a captain or whether he's an alien or what's going on and uh things get creepy so how about matt what did you uh had you ever read this before what'd you think of it Uh, i haven't read it before um so I have mixed feelings about it, and I think that's because I was reading it at, at the same time that I'm watching the show, and I think I sort of conflated the two in my mind because I used what I read in the book to fill in pieces of the show that I wasn't quite figuring out. Um, I enjoyed I enjoyed it. I, I definitely feel like it probably wouldn't have been... Like, how successful was it when it, when it was published? Uh, what was it, 1980, right, or 81? Right. Originally. Like I mean, how successful I mean I cuz I guess I'm wondering like how an audience today would react to it if it if it came out for the first time because like there's certain things in there like where they're talking about like sexing with each other and it was just it, <laughs> it was just the 70s of, like, man. I know. And it was just sort of like okay and there was like, yeah. definitely like a, a male gaze aspect to it. Yep. Um sure was. and, and I, I was <laughs> Which like didn't okay. it all translate into the show. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, we'll get we'll get there. We'll get there. Um You know, so so like you know, I'm familiar with Martin's uh obviously like the Game of Thrones books. Um and I've I've read uh Sand Kings uh and, and love that. Um I wasn't blown away by it, to be perfectly honest. I, I enjoyed it. I can see, like, there's elements of Martin's prose that are fluid. I don't. I wouldn't say they're as fluid as his later work, like in in the Throne series. But you could see that he's 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 got this kind of rhythm to his his writing that is that pulls you in. So, like, I, I found it a fast read, and there were there were aspects of it I thought that were 
fascinating and then like horrifying like so so martin's famous right for like creating characters and then just totally killing them and like <laughs> unexpectedly and so so spoiler when the psychic's head blows up i'm like holy yeah. shit like <laughs> what the fuck just happened like I, it was so so like that part i liked um the 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 part that was less interesting to me and i and i think this might also be with the show itself was was the actual mystery of what are these aliens and why we're going out to find them. Like I, I found that less satisfying than mm -hmm. the stuff that was going on on the ship itself. Definitely. And I thought the ship itself, I thought there was some really cool aspect. I, I like the idea that um, the captain of the ship is this reclusive guy uh, who actually ends up being this weird kind of clone of his mother. He's not actually the son and that he's lived his whole life in zero G. So he's basically like unable to survive or just is extremely weak in one G. He probably wouldn't be able to walk at all if that yeah. were the case, but um, I was willing to go with it. So like, like there were, there were like cool science fiction tropes that, that pulled me in. Um, but I, I don't know if I was completely satisfied when I got to the end. Uh, let, what did you guys think? Well, well, let me answer your question, Matt. This, I think the story was pretty well received when it came out. I, I think it won a Locus Award, and I think it may have been a finalist for the Hugo. It was something like mm -hmm. that. I mean, it, it was well received. And I think that maybe part of it was that apparently there was some um, science fiction critic who had said that you couldn't combine science fiction and horror because science fiction is inherently rational and horror is inherently irrational and the two just don't taste good together. And yeah. so Martin was um, you know, trying to show that you could – Combine the two, and he he did that with Sand Kings, I think, marvelously well. I think I agree with you less successfully in this story. I read this twenty years ago or something, and um, all I really remembered about it was the basic setup of the captain who won't leave his quarters. I think I agree with you that that's super cool. The rest of the story, I think, is sort of like you know so so, and I, I, it was sort of forgettable, obviously. Whereas Sand Kings, like every detail of that story, is burned into my brain. Um, but so yeah, so now let's bring in. Uh, how about Andrea? What did you think of uh, Night Flyers? Uh, I had very similar reaction uh, as Matt. Um, it, the thing, the word that kept coming to my mind was old fashioned. It's mm -hmm. very much um, of its era or even of the 70s era, the way it's written. I was really excited when I read that first opening first person part because it's beautiful. And then it just goes into this very heavy, clunky language of the rest of the story. Um, and I also felt that the ending was a letdown, um, especially the Vulcran, which seemed to me like a MacGuffin. Like there was nothing there. It was just the thing they were chasing, but it ultimately it was meaningless. It was the story of the, the characters on the ship. Um, that was the important part. So, you know, once the Debranen floats off into the whatever it is, it's like, well, that I, I just spent a whole story waiting for some resolution to that and it just didn't happen. Which was disappointing. Um, well, uh, actually, the, let, me, let me pick up on that. So, so yeah, so so they're so so the Brandon thinks they're going to find this ancient alien race of wise elders who are going to reveal the secrets of the universe. They've been traveling, he knows, through space. At you know, there's there's hyperspace in this universe, mm -hmm. and and these Balkran aliens have been traveling, uh, you know, sublight speed. So they've been traveling very slowly through the galaxy. And, um, and, and yeah, when they find them, they turn out to be just sort of like space whales, basically. They're, they're just sort of animals, <laughs> you know, that live that's in a space. Good, that's a good description, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, so, but I mean, I think that that's intentional, that there, there's sort of this letdown aspect. I mean, I think that's part of the, you know, the theme of the story, but uh, I don't know. So Aaron, what do you mm -hmm. think about all this? I think uh, something can be intentional and still a bad idea um, <laughs> and, and not very satisfying. I actually... Um, it was interesting listening to this um, this analysis of this critic you gave that uh, that horror and, and science fiction couldn't mix because science fiction is inherently rational. Uh, some science fiction certainly is, but but for me, one of the things I like best about science fiction um, is one of the things I like best about fantasy is some of these unfathomable, unknowable um, elements of it, and that could be tremendously beautiful. And he has that kind of dreamy gauzy quality in describing the Vulcran in this in this prologue and from this first mm -hmm. first person perspective but we never really get that sense of magic later and so I don't actually I wouldn't have minded if de Brannon floated off into the ether never to be seen again and we don't actually know what's up with the Vulcran but I think 
trying to tick the box of achieving resolution means mm -hmm. that you had better achieve resolution. And that didn't really happen. So it was kind of a worst of both worlds scenario where not only do we not get the resolution we're looking for, but it also lacks, it's just kind of showing you what's in your hand and, and what's in your hand is, is like a peppermint. <laughs> it's like, that's really disappointing. I wanted something. Actually, you know what? It's more like a scotch mint. It's like something you'd find in, in your grandma's candy dish and it's covered in lint. And you're like, really? That's what you had in there that whole time. It's, it's like so opening the box on Christmas and it's a, it's socks. It's it socks you know. that someone else has already worn. Yeah. Which, by the way, my grandmother totally did to me one year with a vest. It even had a used Kleenex in it. But that's another story. <laughs> Okay, well, um, let me let me pick up on the thing about science fiction being inherently rational because, I mean, I think that's more of a idea from, you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s kind of science fiction, probably more of the 40s and 50s kind of science fiction. Um, but that's never really been true of George R. R. Martin's science fiction. He's always been, I would say, like a romantic writer in the classical yeah, sense. He writes the planetary yeah. – when he was writing science fiction, he was writing the planetary romance. They were never – uh, particularly concerned with science or right. rationality or anything like that. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they always felt like fantasy, um, even if they were, they were set on spaceships. I mean, and this is like basically a ghost story or a haunted house story mm -hmm. on, on a spaceship. It's a haunted house story on a spaceship, but it, it, I have to say um, it had so many of the things that I like least about the sorts of sci-fi that I like least. Mm -hmm. Um that it, it had some just bad storytelling choices, in my opinion, like the exploding head. I just howled. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, it just, and it's just, just, it's, it's not, funny until it happens to you. It's right. unintentionally <laughs> funny. Well, and, and a lot of things were unintentionally funny. Dave, as you know, because I had to text Dave as soon as I came across Mamthrax. I just howled. Wait, 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 wait. Like, Aaron, 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 Aaron. So, wait, what? so. So Aaron, can we please on. talk about no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, hold on a sec, though. I want to ask. So, um, Andrea, when you hear that there is a futuristic disease called manthrax, what do you imagine in your head this disease is like? I, I, I didn't because I laughed too. I was just like, I'm not even gonna. It's I'm going past it. There was a lot that I was just like, I uh, whatever, just go on, laugh, and move on. So, but it sounds great. Whatever it is, it's awesome. <laughs> Okay, but okay. How about Matt? Awesome. What do you have? Any ideas? Any specific notions? Of oh what man, I have no say? idea. I don't even know if I want to go there. I don't know. It sounds like some like I don't know sexually transmitted disease uh -huh. turns men into zombies or something. I I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I I thought it was just uh, you know man made anthrax. I thought you know genetically engineered anthrax. That was oh, my okay. interpretation. Wow. There you went. You went rational there with the yeah. <laughs> Um, but but so 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 Aaron, do you want to tell us about what do you imagine Manthrax involves? Well, I mean, the thing is, I know a little bit about Anthrax, and so maybe that's the problem. Um, but so so Anthrax often manifests itself as necrotic tissue on a limb. So start <laughs> start with necrotic tissue on a limb, and then go to man and see where you end up. And that's Manthrax in my head. That's a good just, math. <laughs> It's That's just, also very rational. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah. There are a lot of things that he did like that that made me roll my eyes. And he still has this tendency, I must say, in his his newer writing where he just goes off on a thing where he lists a whole bunch of things that don't exist. And in the act of listing a whole bunch of things that don't exist, calls it world building. <laughs> and you're like, mm, okay, I could have done without that. I either need more or less. But, you know, the the list in itself is anyway, there were a lot of very old fashioned eye rolling moments. There was a lot of yeah. talking about people's breasts. I know women, we do, I, we do walk around obsessing about our own breasts. Um, and I know that if I was going to describe someone's necklace, I would totally describe it as the thing in between your breasts, because I don't know how else you would describe a necklace. <laughs> just little stuff like that, that was just very eye rolling in, in that yeah. story. Well, it's the, it's the, it's the language of, you know, the 60s, 70s era man sci-fi you know yeah. you know I, i've read that in man fi there we go <laughs> goes with man frack man thack thrax man i can't even say it it's probably um, for the best right <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly um yeah i mean that whole thing with her breasts and how big she was and and the sexing with everybody i'm like oh god it's just but well, you know uh, i love but... george he's a lovely man well, but I, I think, you know, if you're in the 70s and you've seen how um, 
sexual mores have changed so um, substantially from the 50s to the 70s, if you just sort of project that out into the future, it, I think it's it's sort of easy and, and rational to imagine that people in the future might have very, very casual attitudes towards sex. I mean, no, that's that's fine. But um, one, don't call it sexing, please. That's very unacceptable <laughs> word for sex or whatever you want to call it, but not sexing. Um, but but it's the focus on it was just. You know, and the size of her breasts and the, her height and how it was just a little much. I think it was very male gaze. I think if yes, it, if exactly, it, if it yeah. were if it were shown from the other point of view as well, and then you know, you know her her bulging, you know, like she points out his bulging crotch or something, I might be like, okay, this is a very you know a sex obsessed culture, and I'm okay with it. But it was it was very obvious to me. It was just like male oriented. But- but I don't think it's a sexist. Uh, once you're once you're in a free yeah, society, yeah. yeah. Once you're in a free society where anybody can um, is free to express themselves sexually, you don't obsess about things like yeah. Maybe obsession is the wrong word. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's more just like uh, freedom free. or openness. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, another thing that he did, which I I don't usually like, is he's got shifting POVs. So it's yes, not exactly. it's not always clear whose head that that we're in. But it's not very successful when you do that and and all your characters sound the same. So, the, the you know, Mel is as yeah. likely to obsess about her own breasts as the, the men are to obsess about her breasts. Um, so it, it's not very, it, yeah, it, that, I, I found it a bumpy ride from yeah. a reader's point of view. How about, that was that fed into the old fashionedness of it. Yeah. Um, How about, I mean, Aaron, Aaron, you were saying that it did things that you don't like in science fiction. Do we have any sort of non breast slash sex <laughs> things that we don't like about the story? Um, well, I think it had a lot of, I think it had some really interesting ideas in it. Um, and one of them you mentioned already was the, the captain and the sort of mysterious nature of the captain, which I think was done well. Um, I think that, you know, the idea of uh, the mother cloning herself to have a sexual partner hit kind of a sour note for me. But um, but the idea of cloning herself to carry on a legacy of some kind um, was interesting. The idea of having uh, Lamy who could plug in. By the way, he seems to be really into into characters called Lamy. I don't know if if he remembered that he already had a Lamy when he stuck one in Game of Thrones. But uh, really? I really missed the hound there saying, "What the fuck's a Lamy?" <laughs> hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually it's interesting if you go back and read all of George's pre Song of Ice and Fire writing. Everybody from Song of Ice and Fire is in them. You know, there's oh, a really? Jamie, there's like, yeah. there's the guy with the yeah. half burned face. I mean, the, he took sort of everything he'd ever come up with and stuck it all into Song of Ice and Fire, including I a lot of the a, names. I mean, Rob. Um, so I, I read a quote somewhere, and I can't remember which writer said it, but I think it might have been C.S. Lewis that every writer has a, a cast of players, and they yeah. and they recast them again and again in books. And I, I think to some extent that's true. Um, well, I have, so a, it's, I have a character that's in. The- a bunch of my stories named Sweeney. It was it's like an inside joke per, only inside of to me but nobody else gets it. But yeah, I had I do that too. Well well the the character the captain Roy Eris is clearly to me a precursor of Tyrion. Um and you see, you know, he sort of goes from Roy Eris to um um Havel and Tough in the Tough Voyaging where he becomes more Tyrion like and then he, you know, and then he becomes mm-hmm. more Tyrion like obviously in in Song of Ice and Fire, but yeah, I mean I I definitely agree with that that there's that George has sort of a cast of characters um, that he's developed throughout his writing career. Um, but yeah, t- to me, uh, the the main thing was it that just felt like a lot of box ticking. But that that being said, um, it's uh, kind of unfair to come back 30 years after the fact and say something looks like rote science fiction because it wasn't rote science fiction probably at the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, how about, do, does anyone have anything that else positive they want to say about Night Flyers? Mm-hmm. Um, Matt? Well, you know, I, I thought some of the, the horror aspects worked for me, like, the, you know, the, the, the dead bodies that are still sort of squirming by, via telekinesis, I thought de- uh, worked for me. Um, you know, the, I, I do agree, like the jumping around in point of view. Um, you know, I, I, I think at this point, most of the, the fiction that I read, when they switch point of views, they switch scenes, like there's a scene break. But like in this particular thing, they were just like, oh, and then this character feels this and this character feels that and this character seeing this. And it it sort of blended into this thing where I just like like uh, 
Aaron said, like, I, I couldn't quite connect with any of the characters, I think. And so, I mean, I, I did, I did think that the, the story itself, um, was interesting enough that I, that I, you know, was, was pulled through. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was, it wasn't something that I think would have stuck with me if I read it a while ago. I mean, one thing I think is really cool in the story is the idea of you have this telepathic um, entity, telekinetic entity that is has very limited powers when the ship is in uh, under full gravity. But then once the gravity gets shut off and everything's floating around, then the entity becomes extremely dangerous and can just point lasers around, spin them around mm. in the air and stuff like that. I think that's a pretty cool idea. Mm. Yep. Yeah. There were definitely, I, I think when you strip it back to its bones, the bones are good. Um, and I think that mm-hmm. maybe, and maybe this is a good transition to talking about the show. Um, wait, wait, wait. I want to talk about uh, the feature film first. <laughs> okay. But oh, I'm not oh, going to no. talk about the show, but I, what I was going to say is that you, when you look at sort of the changes that end up getting made, if you, if you look at the weaknesses of the novella, um, a lot of the changes actually address those weaknesses in a meaningful way. So the, the bone structure is good. And I, I think, Part of it, to be fair, is the limitations of the, of of doing it in a novella or a shorter form. Um, my biggest criticism, and to go back to your earlier question, Dave, about things that that I don't like about some science fi- fiction, is the characters are all flat as, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. There, there's maybe one or two characters that have any depth or any real sense of, of three dimensionality, um, and and the rest of them are are throwaway and they're throwaway in the horror sense like they're they're pieces of paper mm-hmm. to be thrown in the wood chipper and that's what they're for mhm and yeah, that's I what mean, happens yeah i mean really the only character who's developed at all really is Roy Eris by the end mm-hmm. of the story and then a little bit melantha i guess melantha. but a little yeah. bit yeah um but yeah I, I agree with that um all right so yeah but let's, so let's get into the feature film because it turns out that this novella was adapted into a 1987 movie uh, that was so stunningly successful that the director <laughs> took used the pseudonym so that nobody would know he had directed it. <laughs> right. um, one thing that's actually interesting about this movie is that George R. R. Martin, um, around this time, he had published his, I think, fourth novel, Armageddon Rag, which was uh, a pretty cool book, but a, an enormous um, commercial failure. And he was he had bought a house because um, his writing his writing career had been going so well. He had bought a house and now he couldn't afford his house anymore. So he was deeply in debt. So he told the New York Times that he had actually started taking classes to be a, to become a real estate agent. And uh, he would have become a real estate agent if this movie hadn't come along. And the yeah. the money from the, the movie had, had sort of uh, pulled him out of debt. Uh, so I guess that and I think that's probably the only thing anyone will ever be glad about this movie for. <laughs> Uh, did anyone anyone watch it? I think Andrew, I, you I said actually, you watched twenty minutes of it, right? I watched twenty minutes and then I went back and watched the rest of it this morning. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, and I I I am a veteran of bad '80s science fiction and uh, fantasy movies, and this even by that scale, this was horrendous. Um, it it a I I was laughing through it, and I think my face was was. I can see my reflection of my face in the computer screen. It was like <laughs> half laughing, half horrified, like my jaw hanging open for a good portion of it because, yeah, wow. Uh, I don't even know what to say about it. Well, well, just... it, well it's, it's really striking because it's really, really obvious that somebody watched Blade Runner. Oh, and obviously, said, yes. Well, I can't believe I haven't that. seen this movie. What the hell? Wait, you no. didn't watch it? No, I didn't have a chance to watch I it. Watch I, it. I, I rejected I, it based on the poster alone. I skimmed it, um, like when you when Dave first sent the link. I I just like you know skipped through it just uh, just to see, and I was like, oh, this this. I mean, this looks like a really bad '80s film that I need to watch. Yes. And then I just I haven't I didn't get a chance to. So so. What's your take, Andrew? What did you What did you think? Yes, uh, very much trying to recreate that Blade Runner look of darkness and smokiness and mystery, but the problem is they had their budget was like you know ten bucks in a pack of Starburst, so it all just it's awful. I mean, the look is <laughs> terrible, the acting is terrible. The, there's quite literally nothing about it that's good, except it's good in its awfulness. Yeah, well, you know? well, well the, the costumes are unbelievably derivative of Blade Runner, and the soundtrack is a is a very like obvious ripoff of the Vangelis soundtrack yeah. from Blade Runner. But like, no talent 
was expensive no. in the creation of this. Like, like, not a <laughs> molecule sounds, of top. Of it pound. sounds amazing. It no. sounds amazing. Um, and, and so, like, so it starts. It's it's like starts out semi okay for a few minutes where they're sort of setting up the the premise, which again I think is a, a pretty legitimately interesting premise. Um, but then it's like somebody just. Uh, so they have the psychic character um, who's named Thale in the story and in the TV show. They have a he yeah. has a different name in the movie. Um, John or something. Yeah, it's like Mayflower, Mayweather, J- yeah, John something Mayweather, like something like that. Um, and so basically, like um, all the exposition of the of the movie, all all the um, you know like explanation for the mystery, he just like spits it out. He just info dumps yeah. it basically, and they've literally. It seems like they've literally cut and pasted the explanations out of the novella and just given and pasted them into yeah. the script. And he just reads them uh, in a maniacal <laughs> way, in like a maniacal, like uh, wide-eyed yeah. way. Um, and then, uh, to be honest, I, I was sort of playing video games while I was watching this because I just I couldn't make it through <laughs> it, amazing. just like focused on it. Um, <laughs> but like every t- <laughs> toward the end, like yeah. So so then like um, Roy Aris and his. Um, you know, is, is like hanging out with Melantha, and then they're fighting the evil mother. Um, uh, yeah, he's this like is... a zombie mother, by the way, with the with the <laughs> electricity face. It was <laughs> yeah, but, it, but then there's just these like really cheesy special effects where people are flying around inside the ship, and like every time I looked up, it seemed like it was the exact same footage being reused over yes. and over again. Yes. Um, and uh, and then it's different, you know. The 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 Vulcan in this turn out to be like, yeah, some sort of like giant space um, cloud, like pink, like um, LSD cloud or something. Um, <laughs> and uh, from from what I remember, uh, De Brannon sort of floats into it. He um, dies, but it's it's they say that it's the mother who creates this big, uh, whatever it is, and then he floats towards it, and then his pod blows up, and he's dead. <laughs> So that's yeah. a complete. I don't. I don't know. Just was um, there was there anything, Andrea, that you thought was like, oh, that was a good change from the novella or anything like that? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. I from the get go, um, you know, I, I have a pro- I have a problem, and this is very much a thing of the eighties of walking around in the dark with sunglasses on, and that's all she does for the first. I swear, like about five minutes. Also, she's getting on a spaceship in heels and a skirt. Um, you know, that's ridiculous. That's fine. They totally correct that problem in the show. <laughs> yes, they do. Well, no, they don't. I'm being um, sarcastic. Yes, thank you. I just realized that. Um, yeah, it's, it was, I, I want to say go watch it. It's terrible, but also it's an hour and a half of your life you will never get back. And uh, it really adds nothing to the canon of terrible movies. I got, you know, there are much better 80s movies that are terrible that you should go see. Zardoz. Yeah. Zardoz. Krull. Um, oh, I love Krull. Come on. I love Krull. No, in a good way or an it's, ironic it's, way? I, I, all right. I know we're not talking about <laughs> Krull, but it has a it has a special place in my heart. I saw that when I was young and it, I I know it's campy and, and horrible and in, in a I certain underst- way, but I also love it. I mean, I understand. I have a very there's a very special place in my heart for the original '70s Battlestar Galactica. Yes, but I'm not feeling Andrew, myself. I just want a glaive. I just want a glaive. That's all I'm saying. That's all any <laughs> any kid needs is a glaive. <laughs> oh God. All so right. yeah. All right, but yeah, like we can we can do a panel on bad '80s movies sometime. But, Please, uh, I'm but, all there for that. <laughs> but right now, let's move on to this new Sci-Fi Channel adaptation of night flyers uh so how about um aaron what were your uh what'd you think of the first episode of uh sci-fi's night flyers um i should say that i started watching the show before i read the novella and then i read the novella somewhere in the middle and i mentioned this just because it's not it's you never know to what extent familiarity with the source material changes your perception of things um by and large, so I, 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 the other element of disclosure is that I went into this not really expecting to like it. Um, hmm. And in the, at the beginning, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, there were elements of it that I thought were a little bit clunky right from the beginning that could have been finessed a little bit better. But, but by and large, I enjoyed the first couple of episodes. Uh, and then it, it, it all went horribly wrong. 
in my opinion, there was a clear moment of shark shark jumping, which we can get into. Um, <laughs> but there was there was a specific episode that just jumped the shark so spectacularly. Mm. Yes, th- and yes, it I never think I know recovered. Which one. I'm sure you do because it's. <laughs> right. We're not going right. to don't trust me, Dave. You know better than that. I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to spoil it yet. I'm just going to say that this happened. But the so it's hard to know though because I don't remember exactly how many episodes I had seen before the novella. But I think it was five. And I think it was because of the way sci-fi released them in two batches, the first five episodes and the second five. Mm-hmm. So I, I suspect that what happened is I watched five episodes, I read the novella, and then I watched five episodes. So it's it's hard to know exactly. The scientist in me wants to control for this variable, but I can't. But I will say that I've generally found the first half decent with flaws. and And then things changed radically at that middle point. Right. So let's start off and talk about some of the things that the show does have going for it. And one, I think, is the production design and the visuals. Mm -hmm. This is apparently the most expensive sci-fi drama ever, like sci-fi channel drama ever. Really? Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily... I can see that. I can see that. It doesn't necessarily... I wouldn't say it necessarily looks like it, but some of it looks really good. I mean, the um, the bridge of the ship, I think, where, you know, you, you sort of see the view out the front and then there's the sort of, I don't know, the the big arms sort of constantly moving past it i, I think mm-hmm. that looks really really good mm-hmm. um and the sh- you know, the exterior shots of the ship look really cool i think the um the the spinning um sort of a greenhouse things yeah i think domes, are pretty yeah. cool yep. yeah um but yeah so how about uh andrea anything else about the show and the initial few episodes that you thought was uh was well done well well done. Um, no, well, here's my problem. I had, re- <laughs> well, among many, many problems, um, with in my life, not so much with this, but, <laughs> um, I, uh, I read the novella before I started watching it. Um, and as we, as I said, when we talked about the movies, you know, The Endless and those last time we did, um, this, Dave, uh, I said the best way to go into watching something is wa- going into it, knowing nothing about it and having no expectations. Well, I knew something about it and I had expectations. And I think because of that, the first three episodes that I watched, I was like annoyed. Not so much that because I had no real attachment to the show. I just thought it was going to be something other than it was. So I was, um, yeah, the first three episodes was a bit of a slog. And then I felt like once I'd left, let go of that, um, expectation from the novella, I started enjoying it more. Like four and five, I enjoyed more. Um, and also, and we didn't discuss this about the 87 movie, is they, they whitewashed the character. Um, Melantha mm-hmm. is, is clearly a, a woman of color, and then they made in, made in the movie, she's a white woman. And I was afraid they were going to do it here, and then the first image of a person is a, is a white woman, like, oh my god, you gotta be kidding me. And, and I'm glad that was resolved, um, and, and was fixed. But, um, yeah, I kind of never, came back for those first three episodes of getting over the fact that it wasn't as it, it was so much different, but I, I started liking it. I got more into it at four and five and then we hit the jump the shark episode and that was the end of that. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about the cast because the cast I think is, is really good. And mm-hmm. the, the actors, many of them are, are just sort of, um, you know, riveting to watch. I mean, I, I think, yeah, the, the actress they have playing Melantha is, is, you know, yeah. is riveting to watch. Uh, the particularly the the actor they have playing Roy Aris, the captain, is is just mm-hmm. like has an amazing, just uh, presence about him. Um, and so yeah, that's an, an another thing. I think the you know, the the people are all you know, interesting casting choices. I think they all yeah. do a pretty good job. I acting. I thought the guy playing Rowan was really good. Um, this it, guy was a bit of a skeptic, and then. A crazy person. Um, the guy with the axe. Yes, yeah. the guy with the axe. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think they were they were all, the, by and large, the performances were all stellar. Um, I do think that the the guy um, the the guy that was playing DeBrannon got a little too much into the whispery, intense whispery dialogue that that would <laughs> irritate me from now and yeah. then. But but by and large, the performances were great. And I think one of the things they made a lot of serious changes, significant changes to the characters in the show. Yes. And I think that by and large, they made great choices for all of them. Um, they made the characters far more, not just more rounded, but more interesting. Um, and I mean, I think the changes they made to fail were great. Ca- having him as a yob is like a brilliant choice. I, I did. Yeah. 
I did have that, trouble understanding. Like you mentioned, the whispery dialogue. I had a lot of trouble just understand at a basic, literal level, understanding what people were saying in this show. Ex I had exactly I had that same it. problem. I had to watch it with the volume up, and so yep. what I discovered was they were either whispering or shouting. There was no just normal <laughs> conversation, but, and so yeah. like I would have the volume up to understand them, and all of a sudden they would shout, and there'd be an explosion, and then like yeah. you know, lower that TV. It's really loud. You know? yeah. so it's like, <laughs> but it's like it was so, also yeah. it was also for me, uh, me a matter of the accents, like fails very thick cockney accent i was like what did you just say and i would have to scrub back to to try to get what he was saying so that was very distracting and kept taking mm. me out of the story right yeah see I, I wonder if somebody else on the production team had that problem because uh i loved everything about fail i thought the acting was brilliant i thought the ca the character was brilliant um and and I didn't have any trouble with his accent, but I did notice that there were a lot of British characters on the show. And yep. then you have I'm not sure whether Rowan's a, a Kiwi or an Aussie, um, but so but the the lead character to Brennan, well, to the extent mm -hmm. that you can, he starts out, you feel like he's the lead character. He's very clearly Irish, and they very yes. clearly try to make him American. And I just don't understand that. Like why yeah. in the in the novella he appears to be a Russian. So could we not yeah. just have a Russian or you know? Does does he have to be American? This this guy's struggling. <laughs> the yeah. accent. Can we please just? Can he just be Irish? Yeah. Would it matter? Right. right, but but so so the accents are like it, it's it's the accent, it's the whispering, and it's the like totally unset up um like lore. Like people will just refer to stuff once, you yes. know, mm -hmm. from from this world that you've never heard of before, and you're like, what? In in it, it, it's being a just the combination one. of all these things. And I don't I, think they I, ever tell you what teak means, ever. No, no. no. All of a sudden, it's just, this and this happens more as it goes on. Is that stuff just gets brought up or manifest, and I'm like, wait, what is that? Where did that come from? Or they mention, yeah, they just mention it once, and then you're just supposed to completely understand it and go with yeah. it. And and you know, um, I, you know, I, I think that's one of the main issues that I had with the show was was this like, I I felt that there was. Like, I didn't have a clear picture of what they wanted, okay? So I understand that they're going, like, there's something wrong with Earth. I don't know if there's a disease. They say in the first couple episodes, there's something wrong with Earth. And they're going out to the Vulcrans because they think the Vulcrans can, can fix it. And the only reason they think this is because the Vulcrans have advanced technology, supposedly. But we've never mm -hmm. actually seen this advanced technology. It's never shown to us, just told. And then... Somehow the only the the only way they can communicate with the Vulcans is by bringing along a a psychic and which sounds perfectly reasonable except the psychic is is literally like a psychopath at least that's how they present him from mm -hmm. like the get go and I'm like why would they bring this this completely like unstable psychopath with them on this journey which is like the last best hope of humanity like can't they find like a like a more stable psychic like i didn't i didn't quite get that and then they they bring him on board in this giant cage and it's and and then he Very just like Hannibal Lecter. he looks through the window mm -hmm. and 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 messes with someone's brain so it's like well what is the point of the cage then like i don't understand yeah. why they're even locking him away <laughs> if he can just think outside the cage literally yeah. and think outside the box and, and <laughs> fry someone's brain and, and so i was like all right so, like, for me, some of the, the issues that I had with it um, going in and then and throughout was was there was, like, all these weird little continuity things that they weren't thinking about. So, um, you know, you have artificial gravity, but then you have part of the ship that spins. And I'm like, okay, all right. So mm -hmm. maybe that was just someone wanted to have a cool spinning ship. But then you have, like, they're way out past Jupiter. I mean, you see Jupiter – uh, off the bridge they're they're like flying past Jupiter and the guy's talk calling home he's calling his wife and there's no there's no lag and I'm like <laughs> okay all right there's no time lag that's fine you know maybe maybe this world has um, faster than light communication um, but then later on there is a lag when it's convenient mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. thing was like yes. the, the scene the scene where um, okay so so uh, the guy Rowan and uh uh, the botanist name, uh, the, uh, Dr. Matheson, like they're like dating the bee and then lady. yeah, the bee lady. And then like yeah. they're dating in one episode and the next episode, she's not only pregnant, but she's about to give birth. Yeah. And then I'm just like, how that, wait, wait, did like, I, I just missed. Was there, was there, there was a title card that said eight months later. Yeah. 
Yeah. There was a title card. You know what? I yeah. may have, I may there have like was. gotten up to get a drink or something. I must have missed that. But <laughs> which is, which but, right there is an indication of not a gripping show. Right. So it's like, oh, by the way, eight months just passed. Uh, you know, uh, all right. So, so I completely missed that. But then, okay, here's another thing. And, and Wait, I'm actually, going, let me let me talk. I mean, oh, we're getting we're getting way ahead. Where this is this yeah, is a total yeah, mess. Right. But but I'm going to talk about the, the the title card. So just the fact that you're like, we're on a haunted spaceship. Everyone's going right. crazy. Eight months passed. Nothing really happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. This is what I'm talking about, like the continuity things, the spores. So, like, so, so. Okay, okay wait, so actually, wait, 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 wait. I got, I got to impose right. some discipline here. Let's, we'll, right. we'll save yeah, the spores right. for later. <laughs> impose some order on the <laughs> <Save the> spores. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, I agree with you. Where it was just like, it was very confusing to me. Just like because the original story, it's set in this um, milieu where like space travel is common, and there's all there's Earth, uh, humanity's made contact it's far with all future. these aliens. Yeah, and um. And, and and this just and, and and they've made this near future, I guess, to make it all more relatable. But it just it, the world just makes no all the as you're t saying all the different technologies, all the like, and even mm -hmm. like I guess you said they're flying past you. Like, I was even confused. Like, are they in the solar system? Have they left yeah. the solar system? Well, Where I think at void? one point they mentioned that they pass through, they pass out of the heliosphere. Right. Yeah. So so then they're beyond the solar system. So I mean, you know, we're at least we're talking months or if not years yeah. for the journey, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't talk they about any leave. kind of drive. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No. But before they even leave, uh, he says it's going to be, what does he say? Eight months? Eight months. Yeah. Eight months. A minimum of eight months. Um, but we never really have a sense of, of what their light drive capabilities are. And so yeah. eight months doesn't really translate into any sense of distance. Um, but they do. And this is sort of what I was referring to about clunky aspects where they, where they cut corners. They either do the atrocious info dump, which, I don't know. Yep. Andrea, you write for television. Why do script mm -hmm. writers find it so hard to find elegant ways to introduce exposition? It's just not that hard. Um, because they're lazy. And they just dump it in there or they just leave it out altogether. Yeah. And so you e you either get the over-explaining or the complete under-explaining. Yeah. And then yeah. they cut corners like, uh, I completely agree with you, Matt, that you, you never get a sense of why are we chasing the Vulcran? What do the yep. Vulcran bring to the table? Uh, one of the choices that they made in the story, so in the novella, um, we know that de Brennan is obsessed with finding the Vulcran, but it's it's under-explained, I think, in the novella as well, other than yeah. pure scientific curiosity, what is it that drives yeah. him to find the Vulcran? They, at least in the show, make a gesture in this direction by giving de Brennan very quickly a personal reason why he's chasing the Vulcran, which is that he believes that his daughter, who we think um, it emerges, although we, we jump past this in the first episode, we meet the family, this, the wife and the daughter. Um, and you know, the daughter says goodbye to daddy and he's going to go away for a long time. And then, and then you fast forward and it turns out the daughter has died from a disease back on earth. Um, but she very quickly starts appearing to him ghost style on the ship. Um, and he believes, rightly or wrongly, that this has something to do with the Vulcran and the Vulcran can bend space and time and maybe there's an alternate reality. This all gets very confusing very quickly. An alternate reality wherein his daughter has not died. So they at least just they, they recognize that there's something missing there and they gesture right. in the direction of giving the this character a real personal reason yes. to be this obsessed but they don't go far enough and flesh it out in enough of a plausible way. And I think this is a mistake they make over and over in the show. But they and also they... Under, undermine it too, because then they, then they later say that it was the ship's AI that was creating these images from their memory and not the Vulcrans. Yeah. And, and this is never very clear either. Um, it's not, yeah. it's not clear how the, uh, it, it becomes clear in the novella how the ship can mess with your mind um, through the use of telekinesis or some kind of psychic power. But this never comes out in the show, in, in the show, to my knowledge, when we find out that there is this malevolent AI running the ship, um, the, no psionic powers that I can recall are attributed to that malevolent AI. And so it's not clear how the malevolent AI is messing with their brains. To yeah. me, it wasn't clear. Mm. Right. So what the show, I mean, I, like my, my overwhelming impression watching the show, once we got maybe yeah five or six episodes in, was that they had gotten a bunch of writers together in a room and said, here's the story outlined from the novella. Suggest some changes you think we should make to it. And just like people were just throwing stuff out and they wrote every idea down on a whiteboard and then put them all in the show. 
Yep. Like it, it feels it's like, like there was... a Key and Peel episode where they they're like <laughs> uh, they're talking about some movie. They're like let's put this in and let's put this in, and then the 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 producers like yes, yes, yes. That's <laughs> but, I feel yeah, like, like, like that's what they did here. Yeah, yeah. There was like I get the sense of just like zero restraint of like this is the story we're telling. We're not going to put in too much extraneous stuff. We're going to focus on this and this. Like it's just like there's no. It's like all over the place. It's like oh my god. And, no, and nobody like, made any choices. That's yeah. my favorite part of the movie um, Wonder Boys, where she yeah, says writing that is about thing. making choices. Nobody made any choices. You know. Yeah, and, and and they also thematically were kind of all over the place. Like um, in terms of this is essentially a horror in space, or at least the novella mm -hmm. is a horror in space, but the show is run like a conventional sci-fi show. And, and that becomes really obvious where when you look at it and there's kind of homage to Kubrick all over the place, but it's not very mm -hmm. well done. So you have 2001, a space odyssey collides with the shining. And this is very, very obvious. And in case we yeah. didn't get it, they bang us over the head with it so hard that we bleed. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but but the, what they don't capture is the atmosphere. Those are both, both of those movies in very different ways, both of those stories in very different ways are all about atmosphere and this creeping dread and this progressive ratcheting up of the tension. Yes. And they never really capture that. And not only do they not capture it, they then completely puncture it with this, as you were saying, Dave, fast exactly. forward eight months. And so the, the dramatic changes that they've made never really land. And a key one is that Several episodes in, Rowan randomly starts a, a relationship. I think he literally has one scene with the bee lady. And I call her the bee lady because I, I still don't understand her relationship with the bees. She works nope. in, yeah, what was that in the biosphere She and she tends the garden and, I don't know, keeps bees or whatever. But somehow she magically also controls the bees in some way, which I don't What was understand. that movie with Mila Kunis where she's like controlling the bees? Yeah, Jupiter Ascending. Oh, Jupiter, Jupiter Ascending. Ascending. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's it, and it was just about that level of dumb. Anyway, so she controls the, <laughs> she controls the bees. And I, I think she literally, I could be wrong, but if she gets more than one scene with Rowan, I don't recall it. And the scene in, there's, with Rowan there's is like, two. yeah, they meet each other and they kind of make goo goo eyes. And mm -hmm. then fast forward eight months later, they are together. She is pregnant. She has birth. The baby dies. She dies. This all happens in one episode. Well, guess yeah. what? We don't care because yeah. we have no stake in any of these things because they all Can we talk about stage. the lumber? Can we just talk about the lumber just for a second? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? No. Where he goes into the forest and he just he pulls his axe out and chops down a tree and and takes makes a cord of wood and brings it back to build I guess to build a, a crib or something. A crib, yeah. Yeah, crib. I'm like, wait, wait, they're they're they're, they're in cool deep space. Like, like, isn't this the source of their oxygen? And he's like, oh, I'm just going to go chop down a tree. And if you look, when he's coming back, like the wood, it's just two by fours. Like, there, like yes. where did he, where did he, where did he, he mill this skill? wood? Yeah, where did he this, mill it and, and sand yeah. it? I was like, Somebody had a table happening? saw somewhere, of course. There are so many things like that. Like when, so a couple of episodes in, they decide to send a probe out to the Vulcan, which if they could do that, why are they on a ship in the first place? But never mind. Yeah. They get the probe back. It magically teleports back into DeBrannon's quarters, and it's full of organic material, which is Carl DeBrannon, which is never yeah. also never explained. But, but it does yeah. give us a lot of uh, wet pasta sounds and you know various <laughs> dripping of, of bloods. Well, and everybody handles this shit with their bare hands and no masks. I'm like, oh, right. this amazing biohazard protocols you have on this ship. I, I Not totally to mention dig it. Okay. All right, so I just have to I just have to say this because because it's I, the, the the decontamination, right? So you have you have the baby that just dissolves into spores, and she's freaking out. I thought that was actually really horrific, and and I was like, oh, yeah, this, was. that was an affecting scene. And then having like the you know um, what's his name Rowan having to watch his his wife die when she's decontaminated. The set the second that they like nuke everybody in this decontamination, they open the doors. Yeah, like, yeah. Exactly. Oh, hey, yeah. It's fine now. We, we irradiated everything. Everything's fine. Just open the door. Like I, I was like, what? Like at that yeah. point, I mean, I think I, I sort of. Okay. Wait, before, before you complain before about that, anything yeah. else, I want to complain about <laughs> <Yeah>. something else. <laughs> so like, also, I mean, what, what Aaron was saying about, it's like the shining, whatever, like, like this, this um, show wears its influences on its sleeve so much. Yes. And oh, they're yeah. all like, but it's like it's like they took like a lot of the dumbest scenes from every science fiction movie or show you've ever seen and put them in this. Like there's the scene from Prometheus where the person just takes her helmet off. She's like, oh, "Era seems fine yeah. to me." Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. the um, you know yeah. like the the character like getting their brain downloaded into you know like the real person gets the um, 
AI downloaded into their brain from the Matrix Revolutions, which is the stupidest part mm-hmm. of that movie. It's like, and 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 it, it does. It, it comes across so much as a show made by people who have only ever seen science fiction on television and have never like yeah. read science fiction books or read like sci- actual science books at all. Yeah. And but go- it's. Sorry, it felt to me like a, a pastiche of Aliens and Event Horizon, but they yeah. missed the mark on both of those. I really got the, the Kubrick references and, uh, you know, of course, because you've got the little red camera that reminds us of mm-hmm. Hal um, observing the whole yeah. thing. But then in case – so the other thing that they did, this drives me crazy. I'm so over the starting at the end and rewinding to the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um like if you if you need that to create your tension and dread, you, you're probably doing it wrong. So the the, yep. the movie opens with, and it turns out it's not even the very end; it's almost yes. the end. It's it, a, the movie it's opens a false with ending. Rowan running around with an axe chasing Agatha, and and Agatha kills herself. This is this is the opening scene of the show. So we know this yeah. is coming when we meet all of these characters, which is uh, it can be effective if it's done well, but it. Mm-hmm. it is overused in the first instance and, and not very effective in this instance. So we know, in other words, that Rowan is going to at some point go bananas and start killing people with an axe. So we've already got lots of nods to The Shining in terms of the kind of the um, the visitations and the scary room and all of this kind of mm-hmm. thing. But in case we missed it, there's a part where Rowan's standing in the hallway and says, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And I think <laughs> I really wanted to throw my laptop. Like they basically should have just had him go. Here's Johnny and get it over with. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's it's different from The Shining because he gets over it. You know, I mean, he has a brief period of being an ex murderer, but he, you know, he was, pulls himself together. And he has the sads, and, and then everyone's like, "That's okay, bro. That's it happens fine. to the best he, of us." He ate his honeycomb, <laughs> he ate the dripping honey, and then he was okay. You know? I have sads. And then he was back being a part of the team. <laughs> yeah. He's a team player. But the other one where they're just thematically all over the place is like. So they couldn't. They, it seems like they couldn't decide between the structure where every episode leads to every other episode, or whether they were going to go with the more of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You've got the meta arc of the show, the season arc, and then the episodes may or may not individually always feed obviously into the season arc. They have. Oh, you random, mean like the feral cannibal scientist? The random episode? episode six. Which can we talk yeah. about this now? Where they totally well, jump the shark, I, which is the Handmaid's Tale in reverse. And in case you didn't notice, we're going to keep saying praise be and blessed be the seed. And again, I just yeah. want to yes. throw the laptop. We got it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Not to mention the leader, the old, the man's name was Joseph Smith, and I'm like. <laughs> What significance is that? Like, you don't just randomly name people Joseph Smith. So that was a bit of an off thing for me. That episode was just so, like, stuck out like a sore thumb as this has no purpose. It is completely eye-rolling. It is dumb. I mean... Yeah, I mean, you, you you just sort of have to give them credit, at least for having the gall to to come up with the premise of having <laughs> feral cannibal women scientists who milk men for their sperm so they can create mindless clone babies that they can then eat. Um, <laughs> I, like, just, I was like, okay, awesome like they success. went there. They actually yeah. went there. Um, that was insane. <laughs> was the captain just sitting on that table for 14 years? That's like, what it felt like, yeah. And the part where he's like, you should just enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. You'll get used to it. <laughs> and was he the only guy left? Like, is it all his sperm coming? All it was. There was so many questions. So many questions. <laughs> questions. I don't, don't want to know. The I answer don't want to. the answer to. No. Right. No. All right. So I'm gonna hazard. This is like I know absolutely nothing about how this show was made, but I'm just gonna like tell you how it seems to me. <laughs> so somebody realized that they had or could get the rights to this George R. R. Martin novella from 30 years ago and was like, oh, wait, George R. R. Martin's a huge name now. Probably there would be some level of interest in a show just based on his name. And on the basis of that, they uh, allocated a certain budget for it. And then they went out looking for people who could, you know, produce a Night Flyer show. And it, it was not driven by somebody had a good idea for what the show mm-hmm. should be. It was, we need to show a show that we can attach George R. R. Martin's name to. He says, actually, he didn't even, like, he heard about that they were making the show. And he's like, how can they do that? I haven't given them the rights. And it turned out <laughs> that, like, the, he had actually, he had sold the rights. You know, it, it had been part of his contract for the 1987 feature film. And he hadn't even realized it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so he's like, he's 
uh, credited as an executive producer. I, I mm-hmm. imagine he had virtually no involvement in this whatsoever. He, he didn't. I actually looked it up. Um, he's uh, exclusively contracted to HBO, so he had zero to do with it. But that's a courtesy they always do for um, – or usually do for authors of source material. They uh, put their names on an exe- executive producers. You see that on a lot of movies based on books. Yeah. Right. And no, so I'm the, not the initial, familiar wait, with Wait, 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 wait. So, so the, the initial <laughs> showrunner was Daniel Cerrone. I don't know how to pronounce that. He left, um, and the Jeff Bueller, who had written the pilot, took over. Um, and so I, I just imagine they, they, they were like, okay, we need this to be 10 episodes long. And they just sort of reached out to people who could, um, you know, just working professionals who could deliver something. Yeah. And yeah. like so, some of them, were, I think, were trying, you know, like like Matt was saying, like the, the, the Handmaid's Tale in reverse thing. Like someone was like trying to do something there. Um, you know, but it's like, it just feels like, yeah, every episode was made by somebody different. Uh, you know, there was, there's no, mm-hmm. I, there's no overarching story. There's no, no overarching no vision. Voice. There's no yeah. overarching yeah. voice throughout it. And, and especially just kind of goes off the rails after six. Like the last few episodes are just like, there's everything and under the sun is like, throw, let's throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. And that's where I, that's where I just started throwing up my hands and like, oh, you got to be kidding. So the, the the showrunner have like like what I'm not familiar with the showrunner has has uh, has he done uh, other science fiction before this? I, I'm not sure. I, I looked okay. up Daniel Cerrone. He I wasn't he, uh, I wasn't familiar with too much of what he had done. I mean, I sort of heard of it. Jeff Bueller, I, I don't know if I ever looked up his IMDb page or whatever, but th- there's like an amazing lack of like interviews or, you know, anything <laughs> like that with the people involved in this. There was one yeah. panel from Comic-Con that was a 30 minute panel that he was on. Uh, I don't even know if it was like official, like I think it was just someone in the audience had filmed it. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but but the short answer to your question is I, I don't know a lot mm-hmm. about him or what his background is. Well- Here's the thing about like shows and 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 showrunners. The the beauty of Game of Thrones is that the two guys, uh, Benioff and I can't remember the other Weiss. guy's name, Weiss. Um, they were huge fans of the show. They went after George. They're like, we want to do this. They're they're. It was a passion p- project for them. This didn't feel like a passion project for anybody. This felt like a we're gonna make this into a, a cash cow because we've got George George R. R. Martin's name on it. Um, but nobody, I don't think anybody cared. It didn't feel like, it feel like anybody cared to me, you know? To yeah. me, it just felt like someone was unfamiliar with, with like the tropes of science fiction. So like, I, I see, I've seen this before, like it, uh, in, in fiction writing, if someone say, for example, is just writes a lot of fantasy, a lot of fantasy, but never really does science fiction, then they dip their hands into science fiction and they write a story and you're like, okay, there's good ideas here, but there's certain things that are just not quite working because maybe you're just unfamiliar with it. Like, so I, I sort mm-hmm. of felt in this, in this sense, it was like, um, you know, like like others have said, they they watched a lot of science fiction movies and and TV, and they're like, oh, that would be cool, that would be cool, that would be cool. But it's like they never really cohered into a solid narrative. And I and I think for me, that's the main thing that was missing was like I got to the next episode, and you know, we often talk about in fiction writing something called the want line. What do the characters want? What are they trying to achieve? What stands in their way? And that was never clear for me. I'd like I just mm-hmm. every episode it starts. I'm like I have no idea what is happening. What anyone yeah. really wants. I mean, maybe yeah. in the moment, oh, I need to get to this place, but why? You yeah. know. Where is this leading to? Um, you know, Erin, you talked about just it just it wasn't building on itself, like like in terms yeah. of like the, the the thing that Kubrick does, where you just this constant ramping up of tension, and and I wanted that so badly because I I felt like, you know, like like we said, the actors. I, I thought for the most part they did a really good job. Sometimes I thought the script was – not this, just necessarily the script even, but just the dialogue was just a little clunky. But I, I thought like for, for – I thought what the they dialogue were getting, was awful. Oh, I, I didn't mean, want to say that. You said it. Dialogue. Yeah. Some of the dialogue was really Some bad. of the dialogue was awful. Some of the dialogue uh, um, was fine. So some of it was fine. So, I, so like no, – but I mean, like every, The actors every, did a really wait, wait, good wait. job. Every, yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the actors, I think, do a, a creditable job with with the material with, that they're given. The but I mean, yes. like the characters, like it would not surprise me at all if everyone turned out to be a robot or an alien or something. Yeah. Because none of yeah. them act like human beings at all, yes. at all. Well, that's the. Th- I felt to me that everybody was just a, a a chess piece being moved around to service the plot, but nobody's yes. ever like a human being. And and don't even get me started on this crew 
that's there. Like, who are these people? They're just there to walk around <laughs> in the hallways and randomly get killed. I mean, but, it's but like the a crew same full guy of red gets shirts. killed over and over and over. Yes. He's like the yes. guy, you know, Will Ferrell's character in yes. Austin Powers who gets <laughs> dropped into the flame pit. And he's like, I'm yes. still alive, but I'm horribly yes. burned. And, <laughs> and, and this happens to this guy over and over. In the first yeah. episode, he's like slammed around the ship till every bone is broken in his body. But it's yeah. fine because he goes into the regen cycle. Never explained, yeah. but we who we understand this means that you have uh, magic, uh, you know, Fluid. search for Spock powers and you come back and it's fine. And so then he gets burned to death, but, but regen, so it's fine. Yeah. And then he comes back and then he gets killed a third time. And it's like, oh, this poor bastard. It's like they didn't I have a no budget to pay other characters to be red it's, shirts. I, so yes, they just put like the no one guy in the red room. shirt like, oh, just and kill he him just again. has to just die. He's Kenny. Yeah. He's basically yeah, he's Kenny. Kenny. He's definitely Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, so, so, so there was this YouTuber I watched who was doing an episode by episode recap of the show. And it's kind of hilarious because he's like, when Tessie appears, he's like, okay, so, so this seems to be someone who has like a psychic connection with her bees. And I'm going to guess that she only exists in, in Thales' imagination because no one else is interacting with her. <laughs> in the next exactly episode, what I thought. Next episode, That's what I, thought. I, guess, yes. I guess she's just a real person, you know? Yeah. <laughs> who, who had a baby and died and we're supposed to feel sad but last episode we thought she was ai so what are you gonna do with that <laughs> and then it's and then the, they do the same the same thing with roid eris where they're like at first i thought they did the reveal too soon where you know yes. they, they are like there's this big mystery around the captain it's so mysterious that he never shows up but don't worry he's gonna show up in episode two and yeah. it's like oh you guys really you're gonna blow it that early but then he he then he Turns into it turns out that we're totally wrong about him. In episode six, we find out he's something completely different. But oh wait, yeah. he's not that either. And it's just this bad yeah. Russian nesting doll of increasingly yeah. ridiculous <laughs> monsters inside monsters. And it's just and in fact, they did use a, a nesting doll, a Russian nesting doll image. Kinda, yeah. At one point, yes, yes. 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 They did, yes. No, did they, they really? Somebody, that's right. Somebody they finds, did. Find yes. some, finds his eyeball inside a Russian Oh my nesting god, room. that's so funny. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Oh um, my <laughs> but see this is what I'm saying is you they never leave anything to your own brain to put together. They're like, in case you didn't miss yeah. it, you, you didn't see it, we're gonna stand here with a gong and we're gonna ring the yeah. gong every time you see it. Like, gong. I just wanna say, because because we're we're hitting on the show pretty hard i happen to like i, I like going back to the to the sets <laughs> I, I really wow. i really like the captain's quarters i thought like the idea of having this sort of uh 19th century classic um uh domicile in the middle of this like far future it, spaceship yes. i thought it was super cool and like i love like the stained it, glass and it, the old furniture you know, it's, so. it, it was really... very captain nemo you know yeah I, that's kind of what it, sorry it had a resident evil vibe to me Mm. Okay. Which, which I totally, I thought it was creepy and, and really well done. But I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm just getting overexcited. But can we talk about his outfits? Because he just, <laughs> the Captain Nemo thing works. Because he just, I kept thinking of him as the Pirate King. <laughs> because he kept showing up in these shiny puffy shirts, which they explain actually in the book why he has shiny puffy shirts. But that is one element of of cleaving to the canon that they probably could have let go. Or they yeah. could have explained why. And if everyone was in shiny puffy shirts, then I guess it would make some sense. But there's also <laughs> no uniform protocol on this ship, which brings me to no. my favorite part of the show, which is what the fuck is Mel wearing? Oh, my God. All it really drove time. me crazy. It's like she was going to spin class. I kept waiting for her. To... <laughs> it was like, what? Why am I looking at her midriff? I'm pretty sure women in the future do not need to bear their midriff. And, stop, episode, stop, and stop. after episode of her nipples. And it, it's, if this is yeah. Mel <laughs> chilling in her quarters, Mel on a hot date with Lamy, Mel in the mess hall, she can wear yeah. whatever she wants. But she apparently has a role on this ship, although I would be goddamned if I know what it is. Yeah, exactly. She has a role on this ship and she shows up to work in like a, a shiny, clingy, brawless top and a bare midriff and tights day after yeah. day after day. And yeah. nobody's like, you know, I feel like it's kind of unprofessional. To- she needs to regenerate in a tube of liquid. Like, what was that about? She has like, no, no role. She's genetically engineered, but yes. you never find out like, why? Why she's oh, in the tube? She's genetically engineered to live in space, but like everyone else seems perfectly fine on the ship. So like, what yeah. is her? Exactly. Special well, ability, and why can't they have like a foot of air at the top of that in case you need to breathe? Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> but she, this is the thing is like everybody else's role, whether you like their character or not, except for, I mean, even B lady who we still don't even know what she is. She has a clear role. She's like, she, I don't know. She raises bees, but the, but Mel, we're told that her role in this Ocean's Eleven team is that she's genetically engineered <laughs> to be in space, except she literally does something with that one time in episode two, and she's in yeah. a space suit. Yeah. Um, and for the rest of the time, it's like, what's her role in this team except bossing everybody around? And, and we're well, I think she was supposed outfit. to be the, I think she was supposed to be the project coordinator, but they never really make that clear. And she never actually coordinates anything. Well, then what's at Brandon's all? role? Uh, he's the lead scientist <laughs> slash messiah of the Vulcan. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and this gets know. into another issue is that there seems to be no chain of commands on this ship whatsoever. <laughs> oh, my like, God. Don't even get me started on that. And then there's Augie. Whose yeah. idea was well, that? Oh, that whole storyline. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. And but also, point, like, they, like they never planned it. Like they were sitting in the writing room and they're like, shit, we got to deliver this by close of business on Tuesday. You guys. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly need, what the rest of it is. We need a spoiler like. on the ship. So why does the spoiler, yeah. who's the spoiler? Who haven't we used in any meaningful way? And oh, why is he a spoiler? Uh, well, I guess because he was sexing with the captain? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for being the word sexing back. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I felt like, why is there no security on this deck? Twice, twice a crazy person broke in and killed people. You'd think maybe after the first <laughs> crazy person killed a bunch of people on the deck they put a guy with a gun there a security guard of or, some or sort. at least just talk about it like the next episode they're like eh, yes people die it's a spaceship yeah. it happens and he breaks it him happens. with an axe okay you guys have <laughs> laser spiders i know yeah the but laser you cut spiders. your wood with an axe <laughs> right okay the laser spiders, oh, the laser spiders Robocop, kill right? people and they're just like oh it's just a malfunction and everyone's like cool cool yeah yeah <laughs> All right, so there's obviously there's a lot wrong with this show, but we only have 90 <laughs> minutes. So um, I'm going to mention a couple of things I thought were cool. I did think that the memory, what's it called? The memory suite where there's like the, it shines yeah. the lights into your eyes, the sort of lasers into yeah. onto your pupil or something. I thought that was yeah. legitimately cool. It also looked like an Iron Maiden, just FYI, which I thought was interesting. Uh -huh. yeah, oh, yeah, it probably has good soundproofing in there, I, I think. Yeah. Judging from yeah. the shape of it. But the isn't baffling. it just a holodeck, Dave? Really? No, but with like with all the lights, because I think there, I think there is stuff like that in development to like shine those things onto your lights onto your pupils from different angles. I, I feel like I've interviewed somebody about something like that, but I don't know. I thought okay. it was it wasn't like the holodeck just looks like a virtual reality environment. They don't have like mm -hmm. the the light shining in your eyes. Um, but I think it also accessed your memories as well, so it basically yes. get, let you relive past experiences. Yeah, I think that's all it did, though. It it lets you re relive memories, but it didn't create any s scenarios that didn't already happen which i okay. think was when I, things started going weird for him until it did exactly it, exactly uh i'll say like there were a few moments that i that sort of worked for me i thought that this the part i think it was in was at the end of episode two where the captain turns to the, the, the red camera and says this time you've gone too far mm -hmm. that actually worked pretty well for me i, yeah. I thought that was <laughs> i thought it was kind of cool boy you're kind of grasping at straws there <laughs> well, well, that, well, wait, 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 wait! I'm going to mention. Line. I'm going to mention one more. I mean, I, I, I there was a lot of things I didn't like about this, but the the part where they um the captain orders them to um, you know, sanitize what what do you call it? Like just like blast the the whole yeah. room, decontaminate the room, and then the yeah. smoke yeah. clears and he's still standing there. That was a yes. surprise to me, and I thought that was pretty effective. Yeah, that was well done. Uh, yeah. One one of the things that I uh, thought was. Uh, really affecting was uh when uh DeBrannon's calling home to his wife and mm. she's oh, yeah, basically yeah. erased her memories yeah. of yeah, the yeah. child's death yeah. and and then she keeps saying like oh I'm going to erase more like I thought that was really affecting and I thought that they could have played that up more because it's just like you know him uh, traveling further and further away from Earth, everything he knows, and becoming more and more isolated. And then his wife is basically saying, "I'm going to forget everything," and as if you don't even exist. So it's like, I, I think it would have made it a lot more affecting had they brought that forward. Um, I, I enjoyed that, but it was it was pretty short. I thought. I thought you were going to say, Matt, the first time he talks to her on that video screen, there's this distortion over her face that makes her look like a skull. Or oh, something. I forgot. That was super creepy. Oh, yeah. That was never really explained. No. Well, I, I mean, they... I guess the ship was the ship was doing that, or was it the Vulcans? Yeah. 
No, I don't think the Vulcran... Yeah, it's the ship. It's the ship. We never really know what's up with the Vulcran, in spite of the fact that Thale has apparently been talking to them. This is one of the things I was like... There's two different spots where he says, I could hear them clearly, and at no point does DeBrannon say, well, what did they say? What did they say? (laughs) What are they saying? He just smiles enigmatically. Yeah. Like, oh, well, in this in this um, Comic Con panel I watched, they said that they have a plan for at least three seasons for this show. Oh, <laughs> so God! So you're, oh, you're going to see a lot more. Vul- oh. I mean, you're going to see a lot more. You're going to find out everything you ever wanted to know about the Vulcan. No. I don't know if it'll God. survive. I don't I'm assuming know not. I mean, yeah, just just I, I mean the the rev- you know, This is currently 35 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and given that it's the most expensive drama that they've ever done, I just can't see this lasting i mean unless maybe they feel like they've um already sunk so much money into the sets and everything that they're going to give it a second yeah. season just for that just but, to see what yeah. happens uh, i don't they need a it. new i i personally think they need a new head writer and a new writing team um yeah. because they need to have somebody with some direction and some um somebody who can the vision, exactly. That's the word. And and somebody vision. with some storytelling chops, because you know it goes back to to Matt. You were saying they weren't really familiar with with uh, science fiction tropes, yeah. but I actually think maybe they were only familiar with science fiction tropes, and they f- focused a lot on on the details. And you know, Dave knows I have a, a checkered history with, for example, The Expanse. The Expanse is a really good example of a show hitting its stride where they got a lot of things, the little details. I think. Not great in in the first couple of seasons. Some of the acting was bad. A lot of the dialogue was terrible. But you can forgive those things if the story drives you forward. If there's yeah. a clear sense, yes. of, if you have questions as the viewer that you that the showmakers have answers to, and you yeah. and you feel that they have answers to, and they're going to be satisfying answers when you finally get them, and that's what keeps you going forward in the story. And there's no forward moment, momentum in this story because going back to what we were saying fundamentally what what the characters are trying to achieve is too mysterious and so you know what they're trying to achieve as a, as a team is unclear and what they're trying to achieve as individuals and their personal motivations are also largely unclear and there's a disconnect between those two levels and those are kind of just basic bare bones storytelling elements and it makes me think you know the the things that I didn't like about the novella Martin or the Martin novella were that you know details at the end of the day but i thought the bones were good and in the, in a certain mm. way this is the, the, the reverse um there are lots of problems with the details too but some of the details were also cool but they can't make up for the fact that the bones aren't there yeah well what well, the, the the thing that's interesting about the martin novella is the mystery of why does the captain not want to reveal himself and and everyone gets focuses on that and gets more and more paranoid about that and it's it's like even it's like less than an afterthought in the show. And so mm-hmm. they've sort of jettisoned the one thing about the premise that was original and interesting to start with. Yeah. And also does the, I never, uh, clearly the crew doesn't know that there's a malevolent ghost in the, in the shell, so to speak. Um, which, how did they hide that for so long? Was she not trying to kill them? Was she just trying to kill them all because they're going to the Vulcran? I mean, that's sort of the, explanation my brain made up but i don't i don't know and the crew is so feckless like they just go along with with whatever somebody's like oh i'm in charge now because of that axe wielding incident and they're like okay well as long (laughs) as someone's in charge (laughs) and also when they're going to steal the the crystal from the feral scientists they're just like oh we're just gonna put like our evil ai into their computer and take their crystal and everyone's like okay (laughs) like like there's no moral thought about like is this the right even though they're like crazy cannibal scientists like maybe this isn't the right thing to do and no one on the Um, bridge is like wait what crazy ai (laughs) yeah (laughs) are we in some kind of danger daily captain that's (laughs) <laughs> that rather inter- that rather important information is just blabbed out on the deck in front of everybody, which is how Augie, Cuckoo Augie, finds out, oh, she's still alive. Like, really? That's how he finds out? What- Why are you having this important conversation in the midst of all your deck people? And here's a was- hot tip for would-be saboteurs. <laughs> if you're going to blow up your engines, nacelles, probably just don't leave a big screen on your terminal <laughs> on the bridge that says, currently blowing up ship nacelles, stand by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. So, well, so, so, Aaron, so you mentioned The Expanse, and if anyone listening to this has not seen The Expanse, 
they should go watch it because it's amazing. <laughs> and definitely don't watch the, this before you've seen The Expanse. But I think, I mean, I, I can't let this pass that, you know, sci-fi canceled The Expanse. Um, you know, that th this show is, is coming on the, the heels of sci-fi canceling The Expanse. And I don't blame them for canceling The Expanse because I think just from a financial, you know, week, um, sort of contracts point of view, I don't think they had any choice. But I, I, I did have really high hopes that, that this show... Mm, you know, I, 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 w yeah, what was going to be the show that was good? Because I, I want the sci fi channel to succeed. I mean, I want there to be a, sh a science fiction channel on television. I want there to be a show set in outer space. I think a, a, you know, a horror show set in a spaceship is cool. I was all set to, you know, I had high expectations for this. I was all set to like it. And I, I just want to, you know, note that, like, I, I feel like a lot of people are going to now be blasting sci fi for, like, oh, how could you cancel the expanse? And, Give us this shit yeah. instead. Yeah, and... that's exactly what my thought was. I got admit. But but you know, it's funny too because it also is hard to imagine how you conceptualize as a, as a content acquisition person for for sci-fi or any other network how you conceptualize a horror as working beyond one season. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, you know the the whole the whole trope there is it's attrition and and your your characters drop off one by one so. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you also exhaust your bag of tricks very quickly um, without without changing direction in some fundamental way. So unless you do it in a way like uh, those shows where every episode is different or every season is different, um, yeah, then you know I, I think it's it's tricky. Whereas you know a show like The Expanse, like Game of Thrones, has such a long game going on and there are so many moving parts that it's easy to see how you could drag that on for as long as you wanted to. Yeah. Right. Well, well, they're th clearly th going to have to go off um, and make a whole new show now. I mean, I think they're going to replace the, the, sh the, the Vulcan are going to become more of a horror, but yeah, it, there's, there's, you leech off so much tension once you reveal stuff. And I, I don't know where they're going from this. I don't think they're going to be able to ratchet up the tension. I mean, they didn't do a very good job in the first 10 episodes. Well, so. just, just a basic premise of, uh, horror story that unfolds over the course of eight months is just yeah is is ludicrous to begin with you know like it should be eight hours or something you know maybe yeah. like eight days at maximum but like you can't have eight eight months of like a haunted ship you know it's mm -hmm. it, the, the, on, the, on the other hand like the haunting of hill house the the netflix series was like over generation like over a full generation or family yeah but you didn't and, and, say that exactly you didn't see it well I'm, well, well, you I didn't see you, you didn't did. see all all the like every year passing, but they they were able to like jump back and forth in time and and show you different things happening. Right, that, um, that's a good point, Matt. But but the, the show it was like one summer when they're young, and then one week, like the week that yeah. the sister commits suicide. Like, like that's it. you actually see right. dramatized yeah. in the show. It's right. like it where you get you know yeah th those two. I think, I two think there are ways to do it basically. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think there are ways to to do it creatively, but I, I agree with you, like that time jump didn't work in this case. Yeah, there's probably, I mean, pro like anyone who's sufficiently talented can probably make anything work. Um, but like, just, just like, just at the drawing board level, it just seems like, why would you, why, how does that not sound alarm bells just from the but it, start? But it doesn't gain them. The only thing they, the reason they did that is to have her be pregnant and give birth to a spore spewing child. Right. But what did they gain from that? That didn't pay off. It was just like, what, where did that go? That, what they could the have started the, the whole show like a week before they reached the Vulcrans and then do everything in flashback. And then they could have just had like all the horrific events take place the last week before they get there because like maybe the Vulcran presence makes the ship go more crazy than it already is or something. Like, you know, yeah. there, there are creative ways that they could have figured that out. But there's just yeah. no reason other than they decided to do it at the last minute. Like it, it almost feels like they felt like they needed an extra justification for why Rowan is the one who loses his mind and completely snaps yeah. as opposed to any other character. But they did it on the fly because otherwise I can think of no good storytelling reason why he couldn't have been with B Lady from the beginning and have her pregnant from the beginning. And each episode gets one or two scenes where he's making daddy goo -ga eyes at, at pregnant belly. So we really buy... That we, we at least yeah. have some sort of half ass emotional stake in this relationship and his fatherhood and all these things we're supposed to care about when, you know, when the baby dissolves into spores. 
Yeah. And also we didn't really need the baby to dissolve into spores. None of that was really necessary, but it's, but it's fine. You know, it was a very, it was a distressing thing to watch and the scene was well acted and all the rest of it. So if, if that was a destination that they knew they were going to try to reach, it would have been so easy to pave the road before that. Right. But it felt like a decision they made on the fly because somebody somewhere yeah. was like, but why Rowan? So somebody's yeah. asking the questions, but they're not asking them at the right time. There's no, you know, clear plan to, to yeah. make it all cohere. Well, that's what I'm saying. There's no, it doesn't feel like there's a head writer with who knows what the arc of the season is going to be. It's like, uh, again, throwing all the spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Mm. But you're, but you're halfway through cooking the spaghetti before you're doing that. It's just like nothing makes sense. Nothing creates a whole. It's all just like fragmented pieces, the whole thing. And especially goes off the rails after six. Mm. I guess an interesting question is, suppose in, in the unlikely event that they are already greenlit or they've somehow committed the budget for season two, can they save it? Is it salvageable? I put this to the panel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, unless they get yeah. somebody in there who can do those things and fix those problems, no. Yeah, if they go I, back I to agree. the same writing yeah, team yeah. and same head writer, yeah, gone. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean it... Yes, if you if you get a new a new team of writers in, I'm sure they could fix it. But I just have a feeling that that's not what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Well, like I mean, well, because the thing with um the Expanse is that they have writers who are like on Mad Men and like all these you know non science fiction really good shows who can bring, as Aaron was sort of getting at, sort of you know different um perspectives, perspectives. to it. Perspectives. But I, I feel like it's going to be challenging to bring like like what sort of like a team of writers is going to want to come into the show after that season one like wouldn't they have better opportunities you know i mean you don't have to be a famous writer to be a good writer i'm there i'm sure there's lots of uh hungry hungry minds out there that, that could do a good job with it um it's just it you know it would take a lot of work you couldn't there are some sort of storytelling mistakes that you could smooth over and some you would just have to pretend never happened mm. yeah i feel like they, they need like a j michael Straczyn like a young j michael straczynski to come in and just like write the whole season himself because yes, like that... the, the, the big problem with this is that it feels like all these different people were just like doing their own thing with no yep. real co um coordination yeah no cohesion dave you should send them a script you could just whip whip it up and send it to them <laughs> See Honestly, it felt to me less like, I mean, I don't know if it was everybody going their own different direction. I, I didn't feel as much of a disconnect between, from episode to episode as it seems like some of you guys did with the glaring, wildly ridiculous exception of episode six. Um, <laughs> but it it felt more that it was more connected, just that it wasn't, it wasn't leading anywhere. And so I think I get the impression more that it was rushed. Everything just felt rushed to me. Like it was slapdash thrown together and, uh, and you know, really done in a hurry. But it, the sets feel so, so like, I feel like whoever designed the sets put like so much effort and so much energy into them. I feel like they must have had some time to put this together. Yeah, but the script, I mean, the script could have, it could have been one of those things, like you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but, uh, but, could have been one of those things where the initial concept and uh, an idea got completely ripped to shreds or it got kicked upstairs mm. and some network executive who thinks they know something about something got the red pen, <laughs> got the red pen mm. out and started making outrageous changes yeah. and you know yeah. chopped it to bits like it it just kind of smells of something like that to me that that whatever however um coherent the original idea might have been by the time they were ready to start shooting and they had their cast and they had their, their set and all the rest of it, they started making a lot of storytelling choices on the fly and they ended up being bad choices. Yeah. The, the thing about network notes is, is um, there's probably a lot of interference from network people. So I would climb on board with that idea, with hmm. that theory too. 
Um, I mean, I, I think that part of the re- I mean, it may well be that they were rushed, but part of the reason it, it makes me feel like it was just a lot of people who were given assignments to turn in scripts without really working together. It's like like the spore baby. Like that mm. just feels like some some one person had like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there was a spore baby? I'm just going to put it in my episode because this is the episode I'm writing. And that's why it like comes out of com- completely out of nowhere. Yeah, totally. But those things don't need to be mutually exclusive. Um, and one of the one of the ways that because I mean, I think you see a lot of a lot of the shows that I think are really great television, if you look at the writing bylines, episode after episode, oftentimes they're written by different people. It, yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, you have people working in parallel, but there is some kind of manager overseeing it that, that smooths these things that's out. That's what and the they, head writer is supposed to do. That's and what the head writer is supposed to do. That's what head writer is supposed to do, and but also gives them a good brief, I imagine, about, you know, these mm-hmm. are the lines within which you're coloring. Yeah. Well, um, well, well, but usually different people are credited as the writer, but it was a collaborative effort of everybody in the writer's room, whereas this feels like it was like mm. individual people writing individual yes, episodes. I agree with that. But but even so, I know shows where it's a bunch of writers in a writer's room and then each person gets an assignment and it still comes out wrong. It's It still gets that disjointed feeling. I think they assign writers to certain shows because, you know, this character or this character is emphasized and they do that voice well. And they're also, all the directors are different too, which gives each episode a, a different flavor. Um, but yeah, I felt the same way that Dave felt was that uh, it's a bunch of people sitting in their own offices, coming up with their own ideas and nobody's really working together and there's nobody looking at this overarching story. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much that comes up after the, after the crazy town episode of, of six that, you know, the, the uh, astral projection, huh? I mean, that's really oh my God. Like, oh my what God. the hell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, oh. Like, why does she kill herself? Because she says, I'm a danger to the crew. So she's like, let me just kill yeah. myself. This was yeah. one of the things that's just crazy to me is that you've set it up that she kills herself because something horrible is happening on the ship and she's about to get killed by axe wielding Rowan. But it turns out all of that is irrelevant. She was going to do it anyway because yeah. something that has nothing to do with any of those things. So to yeah. me, that that was just really, really bizarre. And also, I thought her whole message was bizarre. Like, that's the opening scene, as we mentioned, of, of the whole show. Yes. So it's her recording a ship's log into a, a really very large recorder, which she then yes. has to physically mm. jettison out of the ship. And she goes to, to yeah. great pains to say, we've sustained structural damage and um, we, you know, you shouldn't come on board the ship. This is not a distress call. This is a warning. Don't come on board the ship. And so yeah. where that goes in my mind is there's some kind of contamination on the ship that's making everybody crazy. Yes. And it seemed indeed in the early episodes that that's, that that's where they were going. And that Mm -hmm. would have been a valid direction, but it turns out that that's not really where they were going. And so her warning starts to make no sense to me because if everybody's oaks by the time, like, you know, if she's offing (laughs) herself because uh, of psychic reverberations, feedback, psychic feedback. Yeah. And, and, and the feedback loop with fail, then unless they bring another L on board on the rescue mission, it's not going to be an issue. In which case, and, and, you know, and Rowan's lost his mind apparently because his wife died. So that's probably not going to be an issue either, especially because we've already established that immediately everybody's fine with him the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe even the same episode. I don't understand then why she warns everyone away and why their structural damage, which is the work of a saboteur, is in any way relevant. Yeah. I feel like they ha- they just put that scene in there because they're like, we just want a hook. So let's just have, yeah. you know, a violent scene late in the season that we'll throw in at the beginning and everyone will be like, well, how did this, how, you know, how did how we did get to this point? Well, and then, you know. It's the Tarantino tactic of. Yeah, or Breaking you know, Bad, the very first yeah, episode of Breaking exactly. Bad. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it wasn't well ex- executed because it's not the final scene. It's a false ending. And then mm-hmm. suddenly Rowan's all good guy again. And, ah. Uh, yeah. All right, all right. Like, I, I, I just got to put put us out of our misery here. <laughs> like the show, it's like if you haven't picked up on it, the show is not good. Like, <laughs> if, if you've been you listening that, to Dave? this whole thing, like, did you get that? Like oh. waiting for our verdicts, and you're like, wait, are they? Did they think I should watch <laughs> I it? Feel like, like no, they're on the, the fence the answer about is this. No. What gave you that impression? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's a, it's 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 a dis- it's disappointing. Um, you know, I hope they still keep making George R. R. Martin stories into TV shows. I'm, I, I think there's like 15 in development, so I guess there's no danger <laughs> of that. Um, I also yeah. hope that they make some non-George R. R. Martin shows into television. Yes. That would be cool yeah. also. 
Yes. Some Aaron Lindsay stories. That's what they should do. They should do. <laughs> Obviously. Well, I I know that Netflix is concentrating a good deal as as from what I heard from uh in science fiction and fantasy stuff. That's yeah. what I read like last year. So hopefully and I I've, I've seen a lot of people on my feed saying that their work has been acquired. So I I hopefully more good stuff is going to come out. Yeah. Oh, actually, actually, that that reminds me because you know this is another thing with sci-fi is that they had announced that they were doing a bunch of classic science fiction. They they have Hyperion, Gateway, and Ringworld, and I think even other things. Mm. Um, um, Brave New World. I think they were doing like all in development. And uh, the Foundation series I heard is in development. Is that at sci-fi? Really? Asimov. I I think it might be Hulu, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm talking about like the sci-fi. Sorry, I'm talking just, about the sci-fi channel. Just the channel. sci-fi channel, yeah. Um, and I just like, yeah, I don't know. Obviously, I feel like so, obviously something went wrong with this show, and I just really hope that whatever it is gets sort of sorted out before they, you know, give a similar treatment to something like Hyperion. That would just break yeah. my heart. Yeah. 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 All right. So I think that's a good note to end on. Nice, <laughs> cheerful note to end on. Uh, so we've been speaking with. Aaron Lindsay, Matthew Kressel, and Andrea Kale. So thanks everyone so much for watching this show. I really apologize. And uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> oh, it was fun. It was fun. It was. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Aaron Lindsay, Matthew Kressel, and Andrea Kale for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So a big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.